Okay, so, same rules as last time. We're going to be looking at a lot smaller, lesser known games and talking about what makes them so great rather than doing full on reviews or criticism. Also, heads up for this first game, it has some bright full screen flashes, and if you can't watch those, you might want to skip ahead to the next segment. I'll include a link in the description, or you can just fast forward by going to this timestamp. Anyway, here we go! At first blush, Void Run looks like a typical top-down shooter. You've got a spaceship, and you've got some enemies, and some projectiles to avoid, and large bosses waiting at the end of every level. All that's missing is the constant stream of laser blasts from your ship. And that's because in this game, there aren't any. In Void Run, you don't blast an enemy, you encircle them by plopping down little void bombs. Once they form a completely enclosed shape, they explode, killing the enemies inside, leveling the environment, or destroying the platforms they're on and revealing the sweet, sweet power-ups that increase the number of void bombs you can carry that are hiding inside. But, in perhaps the game's most interesting decision, the void bombs don't just recharge after you've exploded them. You've got to go around and swoop them back up after each explosion to replenish your stock. It's a top-down shooter with a kind of complicated reload system. The result is that Void Run is actually a much slower, more methodical game than you might anticipate. You're not blasting through dozens of drones, you're playing chicken with meteors and soldiers and ships in an effort to encircle them, and if they should bounce away, or if their powers break the chain of your Void Bombs you've been laying down, you may need to regroup and try again. There are multiple planets to visit, and each one is designed to feel unique, with its own boss, its own enemies, its own environmental hazards, and its own overall look and feel. Some levels have soldiers that will hide in tall grass that you'll need to clear before they can be exploded, while other times enemies will enter a rage state after being hit once, while other enemies splinter into smaller enemies, and still other enemies just have weird movement patterns that need to be accounted for, or countered by blowing up the ground that they maneuver on. So even if the game is slow, it's never boring, mixing up its emphasis on offensive maneuvering, defensive placement of void bombs to deflect projectiles, and environmental manipulation. It's slower paced than a shooter, but it'll definitely keep you on your feet like a shooter. Last time we did a Blips episode, we looked at Overwhelm, a game that got more difficult as you played it by making the world more hostile. Well, Void Run does something similar, but different. You start off with four random upgrades, or you can choose from a list of presets, and as each world is defeated in the campaign, the game lets you choose one of them to sacrifice to the Void. The result actually works pretty well. You don't think you need an extra life on every level, or a speed boost when sucking up bombs, or the ability to see where those hidden upgrades are on the world map, until you get used to having it and suddenly you don't have it anymore. This, combined with the fact that the default mode is only four worlds long and there's something like ten worlds in the game, results in a title that is surprisingly replayable. Having different perks on each playthrough, and different sets of levels for each playthrough, and different enemies and bosses on each of those levels, means that the game feels like it's changing things up really regularly. All in all, it's pretty great. The environments are nice and varied in both game design and visual style, and the purple, pink, black, and white look is somehow very NES limited color palette while still being appealing to look at. And that music is just... Mwah. Fabulous soundtrack, highly recommend it. It might be a little slow and repetitive for those looking for intense spacefaring action, but I really don't regret taking a chance on this game. If the aesthetics tickle your fancy and you like movement more than shooting, I recommend it. You know how the Arkham games are kind of like stealth games about the Predator? Like you're an invisible figure that hunts from the shadows and only kills dangerous prey, stringing them up upside down and using infrared vision and bladed projectiles that are thrown? Well, if the Arkham games are really Predator games dressed up as Batman, I feel like Smile for Me is a Squirrel Girl game dressed up as a Cartoon Network show from the 90s. It's a game about running into a series of outlandish cartoon characters and finding out why they're lashing out, or sad, in order to make them happy again. It's a game that, above all else, is about empathy for others. The premise is that you are a flower delivery kid who ends up in The Habitat, a sanctuary for sad souls run by Dr. Habit. The Habit is a place full of various characters who have shown up for Dr. Habit's treatment, but none of them seem to be improving. If anything, a lot of them are getting worse. But where he and his smile-obsessed methods are failing, maybe you could succeed and help people get better? Gameplay proceeds largely like you would expect from an adventure game. You meet some characters who do a cute spiel about their troubles and woes, and if you can solve their emotional distress, you're likely to get some reward that can either unlock new areas or solve another person's problems. 
The game really takes advantage of its first-person perspective, though. Instead of dialogue trees, you get to nod or shake your head to provide positive or negative responses to questions. And a lot of the tools, from a grab in hand to a pocket mirror to a treasure-finding device to a punching glove, work to provide solutions that never could really exist in a traditional 2D adventure game format. There's also a day-night cycle, which is used to a few creative ends. Several puzzles depend on doing things at the right time of day when the light is just right. It's also used to provide some tension. Dr. Habit has a strict curfew for his patients, and bad things happen if you're caught out after dark. It's not scary, but it provides the game just a little bit of an edge, and it makes Dr. Habit a more credible villain. It also sets up a pretty fun hint system for people like me who are really bad at adventure games. Like the first day you get a quest for most people, it'll be a description of their problems with only an oblique reference to what might be able to fix it. But if you can't immediately figure it out, if you come back the next day, their dialogue will be a more explicit statement of the object or action that is needed to make them happy. And if day-night cycles sound like a lot of waiting, don't worry, you can also speed up time with a stopwatch. There's lots of little touches I like here, from the art style that feels like a cartoonist sketchpad transformed into a 3D space, to the mumbling voice acting work done for each of the characters. But at the end of the day, what I love about the game is what it's doing thematically. I don't want to spoil too much, but like, setting up Dr. Habit as a person obsessed with smiles and the veneer of happiness without actually understanding people's needs, while making the protagonist a flower delivery kid who doesn't directly make smiles, but whose job is to show that other people care about them, is great. It's also one of the few games that does the bad ending, good ending thing that I think largely works, because the good ending isn't just the 100% run through, though I guess it is technically that, but a culmination of the game's core beliefs about caring and forgiveness. It's not perfect, I got stuck a few times on puzzles that weren't well described, and the tone skews back and forth between adult-oriented and kid-friendly. Never outright raunchy or mean, but like, you get a pack of cigarettes at one point, but then otherwise it looks like a Cartoon Network game, so there's a little dissonance there. And despite the game's emphasis on empathy, you help a few people that want occasionally absurd things, like bonking a clown in the head with a baseball. Not harmful, but just kind of... mean? <laughs> but on the whole, it's cute, it's funny, and it's heartwarming, and I can't say that about enough games. If you like character-driven titles, comedy titles, or heartfelt games that don't tip over into saccharine and mawkish, and have maybe just a small edge to them, give this one a look. So this one is technically not a game. It's more game adjacent. Sophie's Dice is the latest release by game developer Sophie Holden, and it is probably the most in-depth dice simulator I've ever seen. Like, I've played Tabletop Simulator and it's fun, but it's not a tool that lets you do what Sophie's Dice lets you do. Tabletop Simulator treats dice as fun physics objects that, optionally, you and your friends could theoretically build a game around if you wanted to. Or you could just flip the table because that's hilarious too. Sophie's Dice is serious about dice. First of all, unlike Tabletop Simulator, you can create your own die. And I mean really create your own die. There are 153 different die shapes to choose from, ranging from traditional D20s and D6s and coins, up through barrel dice and curved face solids, and all the way through to gimmick dice like skulls and pugs. Each die shape has been tested, and its margin of error is displayed when selecting it, so you can make an informed decision about which die is, at least according to an initial round of testing, the closest to statistical probability in the physics engine. And it's interesting to me that, like, the triangular pebble is way closer to a true 50-50 than a coin. Just a cool thing to see. But more than just choosing your shape, you can change the die to have numbers or strings on each side. And once you've customized the shape and the values, you can change the material, the color, the secondary color, the font, the default font color, the highlighted font color, as well as adjusting the size on the display of each side. And that's already pretty impressive, but it's not just a character creator for dice. It also has a lot of really great tools to make it useful when it comes to actually rolling them. First, it has a handy dandy display in the upper left that summarizes the current roll, which is nice. Especially if you're rolling larger hands and need to add everything up. 
Second, it lets you set up and save custom roles so that you can just click and have a roll of, say, 2d20s, 2d6s, and a coin if that's what you regularly need. It also has a console that allows you to type in what you want. So if you need to roll 10d6s and 2d20s, you don't need to manually drag and drop each die onto the table, nor do you have to create a custom roll. You can instead just type 10d6 plus 2d20 and hit enter, and the game will generate the dice for you. This works with custom dice that you create too, so it's really useful. There's also a nice guide that breaks down the syntax for a bunch of other custom things like clamping values and spawning additional die under some conditions, which can help automate multi-step rolls. The point is there are extensive tools here for creating and executing the rolls you need. However, I do acknowledge that all of this is only really useful if you have a situation where you need some digital dice, and while you could use it to, say, figure out what the crew is going to do for lunch today, it's really designed for dice-focused games. And honestly, if you just run a standard online RPG campaign, maybe a text-based website is enough. But I have to say, there's something really satisfying about the clacks of plastic pieces and the thumps as they hit a lightly padded surface. And there's magic in watching these little baubles slowly roll to their final numbers, rather than just hitting a roll button on a website and having it generate a text-based result. So while nothing beats the real thing, this comes a heck of a lot closer than any website. Dan Cop, Daniela on Duty is basically pulling mostly from Die Hard and Metal Gear Solid. You play as Daniela, a cop who doesn't play by the rules, who rushes into a tower overtaken by terrorists. Because Die Hard. And you have to fight and sneak your way up to the top of the tower and put an end to the situation, using your gun as a last resort and having a box you can hide in to avoid detection. Because Metal Gear Solid. And you would think then, with those influences hanging over the game, that Dan Cop would be a stealth action title. But you'd be wrong. It is, in fact, a puzzle game. See, Daniela is free to move left and right, but she can only move forward when she hits arrows that point in that direction. Additionally, she has to avoid the eyesight of roaming terrorists who have taken over the building, but instead of vision cones, they have rods that extend horizontally and vertically from them, and if Daniela intersects with those, she is instantly shot and killed. The result is an order of operations puzzle game with a very light veneer of stealth, where Daniela has to progress through the levels, triggering the right objects in the right order to bypass security cameras, avoid turrets, and duck out of the way of patrols. In a pinch, she can shoot the bad guys, but her ammunition is limited and her gun is just as useful as a means of hitting unreachable switches or destroying power generators, i.e. it's more useful as a puzzle solving tool than as a weapon. Instant death means one screw up and it's over, but the levels are short and bite sized enough that they never really feel frustrating. It's a smart design decision that manages to keep up the game's tension without having the game fall over into outright aggravation. Plus, if you die enough times, the game will spawn a magic purple bullet that gives you infinite ammo, sort of like the helper options in recent Nintendo games. So if you want to go through shooting everyone, that is technically an option. Each level also has a secret badge to find, a timed objective, and a no-kill objective, so there's reason enough to come back through and play through levels you've already completed. I should also point out that the game's PSX influence doesn't end at Metal Gear Solid references. The entire game is pretending to be a remaster of a fake PSX era title, complete with a faux operating system boot and era appropriate art and music. It's charming, but it's also a little confusing because it oscillates between mid-90s era PlayStation influence and mid-80s Bone Crusher action movie influence. The dialogue also has some translation sickness, which could be theoretically nostalgic, but it's more German than Japanese, which doesn't feel era authentic. But it does give the sense that the German-based developers were putting a lot of themselves into the game, and that comes through and is really cool. The game may have some minor rough patches, like the level geometry blocking the camera for a bit, but I can't deny it throws me back to my childhood, even if it's in a sort of weird pastiche of the 80s and 90s. The puzzles are short and sweet, every six floors the enemy types and art assets change up, and it's paced pretty well at a few hours, enjoyably long without overstaying its welcome with enough collectibles to go back and make the game even longer if you really want. If retro stealth puzzling and pretending to be Lady John McClane by way of Solid Snake sounds appealing, there are far worse ways to spend seven bucks. So that's Blips Episode 2 in the bag. I have to confess, I'm finding these really fun to make. There's a ton of great Overlook stuff out there, and I'm not even getting to half the stuff I want to cover. So as long as you keep watching them, I'll keep making them. Catch you later.